We've been dreaming about life on Mars for a long time. Not only about growing potatoes there in the future, but also about all the potatoes that could have been there in the past. Has there ever been life on Mars? Recently, scientists have found something that could be evidence of that. Let's find out what happened. Mars is the fourth planet from the Sun. A human hasn't set foot on Mars yet, but robots have set their wheels. The first spacecraft that visited the red planet were NASA Viking landers. They flew there back in 1976 and sent us a lot of interesting data. Back then, we didn't know anything about Mars. To us, it looked like a cold, lifeless desert. But since we're so similar, scientists began to wonder, has it always been like this? Or is it possible that once Mars used to be thriving and full of life? And in 2022, NASA's Mars rover Perseverance found something that could shed a light on this mystery. But first of all, what is Perseverance? Scientists have suggested that if there was life on Mars once, it's unlikely that it could simply disappear without a trace. It must have left some traces, perhaps underground, where they would be protected from radioactive solar tantrums and other nastiness. So we need to check the rocks. It's important to note that we aren't looking for life on Mars right now. There most likely isn't any. Instead, we want to look into the distant past of our twin planet. We're talking billions of years ago, when Mars could have been warm, green, and far from lifeless. In other words, we have to find dead microbes and various chemical compounds similar to ones on the Earth. This is the mission of our main character, Perseverance. It arrived on Mars in February of 2021. The spacecraft landed on the bottom of the 30-mile-wide Jezero crater. And after landing, it scooted over to the west, to the place that prompted scientists to choose Jezero for research. This place is a dried-up river delta, and this former river is already more than 3.5 billion years old. The Jezero crater itself was once a large lake. Yup, apparently there was life on Mars. And scientists have suggested that these places would be perfect as bodyguards of microbes. That's exactly what bacteria do on Earth. They hide, being still in the depths of lakes and ponds. So we could probably find traces there. The researchers believe that this particular lake has the highest scientific value in the entire mission. The highest chance to find rocks on which such bacteria could survive is here in Jezero. So Perseverance went to the delta. The row wasn't easy, though. The rover missed a little and landed further than planned. As one famous movie said, this little maneuver is going to cost us 51 years. Fortunately, Perseverance took only one year, and on the way, it was able to explore Jezero a little. The rover uses a complex built-in tool to explore the world. The tool is called Scanning Habitable Environments with Ramen and Luminescence for Organics and Chemicals, or just Sherlock. Boy, NASA sure loves its acronyms. As the device approached the delta, the signal of organic molecules became stronger. Soon, these signals were everywhere, and besides, they were the brightest that the scientists have ever seen. What does it mean? Elementary, my dear Watson. You know, Sherlock. It's time to dig! Since July 2021, Perseverance has drilled and collected four thin cores of sedimentary rock. The total number of collected rocks at the moment is 12. This is the first time in history that we're collecting something like this on another planet. These four cores were found on two rocks called Skinner Ridge and Wildcat Ridge. The first pair of cores, the ones from the Skinner Ridge, don't seem very interesting at first glance. They're quite close to what we can find in many places on Earth. However, if we look at them closer, we'll see that they're dotted with round grains of some dark material. These dark grains could have once been deposited on them by an ancient river, the same one that flowed into Jezero. It's possible that the river brought them from places hundreds of miles away from Jezero. And that's pretty cool. If we study these cores, we'll be able to learn even more about the far corners of Mars. Well, there are no corners on it, but you get the idea. Then, in April 2022, Perseverance did arrive at the delta. And then scientists finally found what they were looking for. The discovery, to put it mildly, excited them. 
they found two more cores, which held organic substances. This pair was taken from the Wildcat Ridge. It's found very close to the Skinner Ridge, but the two rocks are quite different from each other. These samples are lighter in color and more uniform. Most likely, they're mudstone, an unusual rock similar to clay, but harder and unable to absorb water. They're also finer grain than the cores of the Skinner Ridge. Why does it matter? Because the finer the grains in the stone, the more likely it is that there may be some traces of a past life in it. On Earth, fine-grained stones most often lie on the bottoms of ponds and in similar places. There, they can preserve the remains of dead organisms and similar stuff for years. And this is exactly what we found on them. Additionally, according to scientists, there was more organic matter in these two cores than in any other place studied by Perseverance so far. It probably accumulated there while the lake was gradually evaporating billions of years ago. So, there really was life on Mars? Well, let's slow down a little. Organic substances are molecules holding carbon. And yes, on Earth, they're most often associated with life, but not always. Sometimes they can form as a result of other things. Therefore, we cannot say for sure whether there was life on Mars. We don't know if these molecules really remain from some Martian microbes, or if they're the result of some other things. But the discovery is still very significant. We have to literally keep digging this way. To learn more about this organic matter, scientists need to collect a couple more samples of fine-grained rock. It would also be great to study the material lying around these former reservoirs. Perseverance has already moved to another area, to a place with a beautiful name, Enchanted Lake. Now it needs to look for similar things there. It will also continue to study Lake Jezero. Eventually, Perseverance will climb to the top of the delta and then continue exploring ancient sites outside the crater. Sometime before the end of 2022, Perseverance will probably have six or more samples of the Martian cores. Unfortunately, its tools, though complex, are quite limited. This data alone won't be enough for us to get a complete picture. Therefore, NASA plans to send other spacecraft to Jezero in the coming years. Together with the European Space Agency, they're working on the next robotic mission, known as the Mars Sample Return. The name speaks for itself. These devices will arrive and take away all the test tubes from the old Prospector Perseverance. After that, these samples will be delivered to Earth, though not by Amazon Prime, and then scientists will be able to analyze them in advanced laboratories. However, all this will take a really long time. The launch of this mission is scheduled for 2027-2028, and the spacecrafts won't be able to return until 2033. But if everything goes well, it will be the first samples in history delivered to Earth from Mars. In other words, there's still enough space for research, literally. And yes, we don't yet know the true meaning of these finds. But that's why the entire mission was created, right? And who knows? Maybe in a few years, we'll finally find out the truth about what happened on Mars billions of years ago. Ooh, check out the Martian! Made you look! To look. There are tons of weird things on Mars. Spoons, noodles, doors, even faces. Are they all really just rocks? Besides, it's not the only planet in our solar system full of mysterious things. Let's check them out. Recently, we found a strange thing on Mars that looks like a smooth, spoon-like object. It grabbed everyone's attention after NASA's Curiosity rover spotted it. The rock, with a handle and rounded tip, looks like it's floating in the rover's photo. People on the internet are puzzled about what it might be. Some are joking that it's a Martian's bowling pin, or even a shoehorn left by extraterrestrial creatures. But Andrew Good from NASA says it's not that exciting. Turns out, it's just a rock shaped by the wind over a long time. These kinds of rocks with odd shapes are common on Mars. They're called ventifacts. Ventifact is a rock that can get scratched, dented, or smoothed out by tiny particles carried by the wind. You'll usually find these kinds of rocks in dry places where there's not much grass or trees to block the wind, and where there's a lot of sand blowing around. 
Sometimes, the wind can carve ventifacts into really cool shapes, like the mushroom rocks you can see in the White Desert National Park in Egypt. These rocks look like giant mushrooms because the wind wears away the bottom part faster than the top, making them stand tall and slim. Ventifacts aren't the only cool Martian rocks. Check out this series of surreal spikes protruding from the red surface. NASA's Curiosity rover stumbled upon them while exploring the Gale Crater on Mars. They quickly caught everyone's attention. Twisting structures resembling spikes looked like some extraterrestrial doors. Even the SETI Institute, an organization focused on searching for extraterrestrial life, tweeted about the image, referring to it as a cool rock. But in reality, these are just hoodoos. These tall and thin spires occur when hard rock sits atop softer rock layers. Martian spikes are likely cemented fillings of ancient fractures in sedimentary rock, with softer material eroded away over time. Again, there are many hoodoos on Earth, too. They're also called fairy chimneys or tent rocks. You can find them in places like Utah's Bryce Canyon and the Colorado Plateau. NASA is excited about these weird structures because they can help us learn more about the history of the Gale Crater. There was also a rock that looked like a jelly donut. We call this rock Pinnacle Island. It was spotted by NASA's cameras. However, just four days earlier, it was nowhere to be seen. So how did it magically disappear? In a very anticlimactic way, it was kicked up by one of Opportunity's wheels as it traversed the Martian terrain. But there's still some mystery surrounding that jelly donut. Analysis revealed that Pinnacle Island contains unusually high levels of sulfur and manganese. Both of these things are water-soluble. In other words, there might have been some water action that created these elements in the rock. So this tiny thing suddenly caused a lot of drama and an entire lawsuit against NASA. It claimed that the agency failed to investigate a possible fungus growing on Mars. Mmm, jelly donut fungus. But not all our findings are natural. Another puzzling discovery was this thing the Perseverance rover spotted. It's something that looks like tangled spaghetti or string. Just like the donut, this mysterious object showed up in a rover camera image and then vanished from the sandy ground in several days. It turns out that it could be debris from the rover's landing system. Perseverance landed in the Jezero crater in February 2021. It had a rough landing and accidentally scattered debris around. Some of these debris pieces have been showing up in the rover's images for a while now. The string-like object is likely a piece of shredded Dacron netting, which is a type of fiber used in thermal blankets. These blankets help regulate equipment temperatures during the super hot process of landing on Mars. It probably underwent significant unraveling and shredding due to strong forces during the landing. Thermal blankets lost a bunch of stuff back then. For example, this shiny foil piece spotted in June. The rover found it on a rock. What's remarkable is how far some of the debris has traveled. The rover landed about 1.2 miles away from where it's currently exploring. It's probably because the crash threw the debris into the air and the Martian winds carried it over such a distance. Mars is known for its strong winds, which can move lightweight objects. However, while it's fun to stumble upon them on images, there are concerns about the debris and trash on Mars. We haven't even fixed this problem on Earth, and we're already creating it on Mars. The debris we left on the red planet is already accumulating in an area called Hogwallow Flats. Plus, the debris can accidentally contaminate the sample tubes used for collecting Martian rocks. So far, NASA isn't overly worried about this, but they're keeping a close eye on it to prevent any issues with the rovers. Now, how about not things, but animals? Curiosity caused quite a stir when it captured something that looked like a rat on Mars. Some started speculating that it could be evidence of indigenous Martian life, or even that this rodent was brought along by Curiosity. But the Mars rat, once again, turned out to be just a weird rock. It looked interesting because of the natural processes like wind erosion and mechanical abrasion. 
we also found some worm-looking things. Curiosity snapped a picture of a formation that looks like worms wriggling across the Martian landscape. Despite its tiny size, this formation stands out with its unique shape and rough texture. It's probably made of durable material resistant to Mars's harsh erosion. And finally, our top mysterious finding is the face on Mars. Sidonia is a region on Mars that has captured both scientific and popular interest. It's located in Mars's northern hemisphere. It lies between heavily cratered regions to the south and relatively smooth plains to the north. There's a theory that the northern plains may have once been ocean beds. Maybe Sidonia was once a coastal zone. This place is full of interesting and beautiful features that tell us a lot about the history of the Red Planet. But its most interesting feature was the Martian face. This thing gained widespread attention when it was snapped by the Viking 1 orbiter in 1976. Some believe that it was evidence of a long-lost Martian civilization. At first, NASA dismissed it as a trick of light and shadow. But after some analysis, it turned out to be, yep, another rock. We also saw a face of a bear. It was captured by the high-resolution imaging experiment camera. In an image, we can see a circular fracture pattern that looks like a bear's head, with two craters forming the eyes and a V-shaped collapse structure like the nose. The head likely formed because something heavy settled on top of an old hole in the ground. This hole was filled with either lava or mud. The nose-like feature is speculated to be a volcanic or mud vent. But why do we keep seeing these strange things on Mars? Sometimes our brains can trick us into seeing things like faces or objects and rocks and other things. But these are just illusions called periodolia. Periodolia is a psychological phenomenon that makes us see familiar patterns or shapes, especially faces, where none actually exist. It's because the brain encounters something it doesn't recognize or understand right away. It tries to find things that look the most like this one. So it sees random patterns, textures, or sounds as something meaningful and recognizable. That's why a chair and clothes on it seems like a super creepy human-like figure at night. It also causes you to see faces or shapes in clouds, or hear recognizable sounds and even words in random noise. It's a fascinating proof of the power of our perception, but we also should be careful with it and not let our imagination run wild. So Mars has two moons, Phobos and Deimos. And apart from the bizarre shape, there's nothing remarkable about them, except for one thing. Not so long ago, scientists discovered a strange phenomenon on the surface of Phobos, and they still can't find any explanation for it. What is this phenomenon? And what does it tell us about the history of our solar system? Let's find out. American astronomer Asaf Hall discovered Phobos and Deimos back in 1877. Did you know that all the planets in our solar system are named after Greek and Roman deities? For example, Mars or Ares is the famous deity of war. That's why the satellites of this red planet were named after the sons of Ares, Phobos and Deimos. These beautiful names actually have creepy meanings. Fear and Horror in 1971, NASA's Mariner 9 telescope took the first pictures. That's how we found out that these guys weren't at all like our moon. They had this weird shape, a strange and unstable orbit. Moreover, there are no other moons in the solar system that move as close to their parent planet as these two. Well, they are its suns after all. But even though they are very close to Mars, if you were standing on the surface of the red planet, you would hardly be able to see them. That's because the curvature of Mars hides Phobos and Deimos from view. Even if you were somewhere on the equator, Phobos would look like an ordinary asteroid to you, and Deimos would look like a star. All because these satellites are basically crumbs compared to our moon. They're the smallest and least bright moons in the entire solar system, which is ironic considering their mighty names. Anyway, 
It seems that everything should be pretty clear with these two satellites. But nope, there's a problem. You see, scientists reconstruct the history of space based on the traces found on different space objects. Dents, scratches, cracks, all these things can tell us what happened billions of years ago. For a long time, scientists were sure that, just like their Greek prototypes, Phobos and Deimos were twins. But then, NASA's Viking orbiter took new photos of the satellites, and that's when they discovered a significant difference between the two. The entire surface of Phobos was covered with huge grooves. Those were a series of long, deep pits stretching from one end of Phobos to the other. You may say, what's the big deal? All space objects have this kind of stuff on them. And yeah, there are other satellites with similar grooves and scratches, but none of them has as many as Phobos. It's completely covered in grooves, and they're huge, up to 12 miles long and 660 feet wide. And that's not all. Some of these grooves intersect with others. This means that Phobos has experienced not one, but many traumatic events. But what exactly happened to it? Actually, scientists are still not completely sure. However, they have a few ideas, and these theories can tell us not only about the past of Phobos, but also predict its future. Theory 1. Asteroid Impact Well, the first suspect is quite obvious. There's a large, almost 6-mile wide crater on Phobos. It's called Angeline Stickney. It was named after the wife of Asaf Hall, the scientist who discovered the satellites. Adorable. So that's what the first theory sounds like. Once upon a time, an astronomical body crashed into Phobos. The impact was so strong that it left a large crater. And the effect of the collision left a bunch of grooves everywhere on Phobos. It sounds logical at first. However, scientists have noticed a flaw in this theory. They learned that these grooves actually formed not inside the crater, but next to it. So it wasn't a collision that created them. Besides, what about those grooves that intersect with the others? Or is it just a big cosmic coincidence? Well, the search for truth continued. Theory 2. It's all because of space debris. Yes, there's a difference between these two theories. In this case, the grooves aren't a direct consequence of the collision. Rather, it goes something like this. Something crashed into Phobos. This impact caused a bunch of rocks to be thrown into space. Some of them were lost in the universe forever, but others were small enough to be pulled back to Phobos. Passing next to the moon at a steep angle, they would crash into it, jumping away, and so on. And since the gravity of Phobos is very weak, perhaps they couldn't stick to it. In other words, these rocks were continuously pulled toward and pushed off of the satellite for many, many years. This theory explains the intersecting grooves. It's because the rocks were constantly falling into those places. It sounds quite logical, but there's another problem. We don't see any boulders on Mars or on the surface of its moons. But all this debris was supposed to get trapped by gravity and remain somewhere in the planet's orbit. This or simply become part of Phobos. In other words, if this were true, we'd find evidence of this theory under layers of dust. But that didn't happen, so this explanation didn't satisfy astronomers either. Therefore, they continued to look for the culprit. Maybe the grooves have nothing to do with Stickney Crater at all. Maybe the real culprit is something else, something even more powerful. Could it be Mars itself? Theory 3. Mars is a twist villain. The previous theories imply that Phobos and Deimos were originally pieces of Mars. Like, once upon a time, they broke away from it and became satellites, just like our moon. But what if that wasn't the case? Observations made by NASA's Mars Global Surveyor show that Phobos and Deimos are made up of elements which are mainly found in meteorites and asteroids. So, what if Phobos and Deimos are asteroids? There's an asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter. Given the size, shape, and composition of Phobos and Deimos, scientists have suggested that once upon a time, they belonged to this belt. However, one day, they flew out of it. 
and then gravity pulled them to Mars. This phenomenon is called asteroid capture. It's very strange though. Yeah, the asteroid capture isn't uncommon, but these two have been flying next to Mars for what, billions of years? It's weird that their orbits have remained the same. In addition, the atmosphere of Mars is very rarefied, and because of this, it could hardly capture any asteroids. In theory, they should have separated from Mars at the first opportunity. However, this didn't happen. It means that somehow, they got stuck and Mars immediately began to destroy them. Yep, an unexpected twist. In this version, Mars turns out to be a villain. By studying the past, we've found some evidence of future crimes. The mysterious grooves of Phobos could be caused by tidal forces between Mars and Phobos. The Moon and Earth also exchange these, slightly distorting each other. But since Phobos is much closer to Mars, the impact of gravitational forces is much stronger. In other words, the gravity of Mars is gradually destroying Phobos. Every 100 years, the satellite gets 0.7 inches closer to Mars. It also shrinks as much as 6.5 feet, becoming even more fragile and weaker. The smaller it gets, the more the tidal forces impact it, creating strange grooves and scratches on Phobos. Yep, somewhere in 30 to 50 million years, Phobos will either collide with Mars or disintegrate and turn into a bunch of small rocks. And then Mars will also have rings, like Saturn and Neptune. That's why Phobos is called the doomed Martian moon. Anyway, these are all only theories, but the dramatic backstory of Phobos gives us an idea of how dynamic extraterrestrial objects can be. The more we learn about them, the more we discover about the secrets of the origin of not only Mars, but also other objects in our solar system. If one day we really colonize Mars, studying its moons can help us a lot. Let's hope that the upcoming MMX mission will reveal some of the most exciting secrets Mars's moons are hiding. Dust storms on Mars can really go crazy. They hurtle through the red planet's southern hemisphere, especially during the summer. These storms can grow and encompass large areas of the planet, as happened in January 2022. Then, a dust storm covered almost twice the area of the United States. Could it be something like this that caused one of the robots we sent to Mars to go missing? The atmosphere and climate are harsh on Mars. It's mostly a desert with strong winds and average temperatures of minus 81 degrees Fahrenheit. It drops down to minus 220 at the poles during the winter. A lander needs to be specifically equipped and very sturdy to withstand such conditions. But researchers thought the Beagle 2 could handle the difficult trip to the Red Planet. June 3, 2003. A team of researchers got one of their pioneering robots they were about to send to space ready. It was a small and compact lander called the Beagle 2. Its mission was to touch down on Mars and search for what the world has been actively looking for for decades now – life on the red planet. Now, the touchdown was due on December 25th, but the signal never came. The team tried to contact the spaceship, but at one point, they had to accept they wouldn't be able to reach it. Some thought the landing was too difficult and complex after all, so the lander crashed. But they couldn't find any technical errors. Others had a theory that the lander may have become entangled in its own parachute and fell down to the surface of Mars. Either way, the Beagle 2 was considered missing. Until 2015, when NASA took pictures of what could be the remains of the lost lander. They weren't just smashed debris, the components actually looked to be intact. The lander's remains were lying with its solar panels partially deployed around 3 miles away from the site where it was supposed to land. Apparently, the Beagle 2 managed to land successfully, but its radio antenna got blocked. That's why researchers couldn't control it from Earth or communicate with it. But no one knows exactly why it happened. Have you heard of a face on Mars? In the 1970s, one of NASA's spaceships took the iconic images of the Martian surface that showed a face-like formation, as you can see in the upper part of the picture. If you have a rich imagination, you can easily see a nose, two eyes, a mouth, and an unusual hairdo. Some even thought it was a monument built on the red planet by another civilization. 
How about some other unusual things people have found on Mars? Like Happy Face Crater. You can easily see why it has this nickname. Or rocks in different shapes. A pancake, brachiosaurus, or a fish. Mars also has a waffle-shaped island on its surface. It's a 1.2-mile-wide feature you can see in the area of lava flows. It might be the result of lava pushing this formation from below. It seems astronomers have also got some images of blue dunes. It's a sea of stunning dark dunes that strong winds sculpted into long lines. They surround the planet's northern polar cap and cover a region as large as Texas. The red planet is usually known for its brown sandy dunes. So these ones certainly came as a surprise. In reality, though, they're not really blue. If you could visit Mars right now just to take a look, you'd see that these dunes appear brown and orange like the rest. And the picture is a false color image. Scientists often use false colors to highlight differences in something. For example, here, it's the difference in depth. Also, the biggest valley on Mars is so large it could eat our Grand Canyon for breakfast. It's a fascinating system of canyons 2,500 miles long called Valles Marineris, and it's over 10 times as long as the Grand Canyon. Now, if you could stretch this Martian canyon, it would go from coast to coast of the entire United States. Since Mars doesn't have any active plate tectonics, no one knows for sure how this canyon formed. One theory says a chain of volcanoes located on the other side of Mars, the one that includes Olympus Mons, bent the crust from the opposite side of the planet. This powerful force caused cracks in the Martian crust, as well as activated enormous amounts of water lying under the surface. This water then emerged and carved the rock away. The force activated glaciers too, and they possibly created new pathways in this gigantic canyon system. Volcanoes on the Martian surface could have erupted about 50,000 years ago, although the most powerful eruptions happened 2-3 to three billion years ago. But the planet doesn't have active volcanoes today. Most of the heat stored in its interior during the planet's formation has been lost. So now, Mars's outer crust is way too thick for the molten rock to reach the surface. But a long time ago, eruptions formed giant volcanoes, and these volcanoes most likely had an important role in melting ice deposits, which released floods of water onto the Martian surface. Now Mars has a thin atmosphere with a volume of gas, mostly carbon dioxide, less than 1% of Earth's. But 4 billion years ago, it was way warmer and wetter than now. Its atmosphere must have been thicker back then, too. That's why it could create a powerful greenhouse effect and trap sunlight. Mars also has a powerful magnetic field. Similar to Earth's, it formed because of the currents of molten metals in the planet's core. But unlike our home planet, Mars lost its magnetic field after its core had cooled down. And without it, the planet didn't have any protection from the solar wind, which is a stream of charged particles flowing from the sun. The solar wind pulled away most of Mars's atmosphere in just a couple of hundred million years, give or take. This is what makes those powerful Martian dust storms even more intense. Mars has a fascinating history. Judging by the planet's glaciers, Mars has probably gone through multiple ice ages, just like Earth. A team of researchers got images of about 60,000 Martian rocks. Rocks were different in size and distributed randomly, which means they probably formed during different ice ages. Glaciers hide their own stories, too. Who knows what kinds of gases, rocks, or even microbes could be trapped inside. Now, if you could get into a time machine and stop it 4 billion years ago, on Mars, of course, the chances are you'd see spectacular scenes of flooding. Maybe there would even be some form of life on the planet's surface. A strong meteorite impact that formed the red planet's Gale crater could be something that triggered that mega flood. After that collision, the temperatures on the planet got insanely hot. This caused the melting of all that ice that was stored on the Martian surface at that time. The flooding was so massive, it changed the geological structure of the planet's surface. It carved out big ripples, as well as waves in the sedimentary rock. Now, speaking of water, vapor has been noticed escaping the atmosphere of Mars. Also, researchers have found some evidence of water flowing on the planet's surface. There are dark streaks in the soil. They seem to get bigger in the summer and shrink over the winter. There are numerous dried-out valleys and river channels on the planet. 
it's possible that liquid water once flowed there. Now, most of it could be locked up in ice caps or even hidden under the surface. More and more things hint that Mars used to be habitable. Mars is the only planet we know about where only robots live. Five rovers make up the Martian population. Those are Perseverance, Opportunity, Spirit, Sojourner, and Curiosity. These robots are there to take pictures and samples of soil and air and maybe even find life on the red planet. And someday, we may reunite with them on Mars. Who knows? Oh, and by the way, if you really could get into a time machine and stop it 4 billion years ago on Mars, then I'd like to buy you lunch and talk about it. My treat. Imagine you're stepping on board a once-in-a-lifetime Arctic expedition that departs to the east coast of Cape Bathurst in Canada's Northwest Territories. It's said that the location you're headed is unmatched on planet Earth. The final destination is an unbelievable location known as Smoking Hills. These red-striped rocks have been burning there continuously for centuries. It has minerals there that are only found outside our planet, on Mars. Some scientists even believe that the site can be an important case study for discovering life on the red planet. On board the small cruiser ship, you head out to the deck and spot an unusual scene on the horizon. You see clouds of smoke forming close to a seaside hill. It's as if a party of hundreds of people did campfires all at the same time. But this smoke is not man-made, your guide tells you. Naturally, most people guess it's a volcano. Some people on the deck even guess that an eruption might happen anytime soon by the looks of it. Your guide <laughs>, laughs, explaining that this is far from the case. Volcanoes are usually found on the edge of tectonic plates. It's a rupture on the crust of the Earth that allows hot lava and gases to escape to the surface. In the Smoking Hills, the story is different. The constant smoke is caused by a natural phenomenon. But you'll learn all about it over the next few days. As strange as it may sound, these rocks didn't begin burning yesterday. According to experts, the ground on Smoking Hills has been releasing clouds of smoke for at least a couple hundred years. Non-stop. You heard it right. But experts are still unsure how long they've been burning. It could be thousands of years. Now before you leave the ship, some instructions are in order. The expedition leader explains you're going to enter a high-risk place. So we replace your regular hiking boots and clothes with a special suit and gas mask before stepping on site. The clouds of smoke you are now watching from a safe distance are composed of sulfuric acid. This chemical is highly toxic. You need to be careful while breathing its air. So remember to keep those masks on. Oh, and as tempting as it may look, don't touch anything with your bare hands. Legend says that the first crew to explore the Smoking Hills found it by mistake. And imagine, these people had none of the gear you're going to use. First written records on the Smoking Hills date back to the 1800s. Irish explorer Captain Robert McClure led an expedition to find the lost explorer Sir John Franklin and had disappeared for over five years. The crew took a wrong left along the way and stumbled upon these burning rocks. They also thought it was an active volcano, much like you did, but they discovered how wrong they were when they stepped on sight. McClure got curious and took a sample rock back to the boat, and the story says it burnt a hole through his mahogany desk. Remember this when you feel like taking a souvenir home with you. It might not burn a hole on your desk, but it sure will fly through your pocket or any container you try to use to take it. Now, it's day two, and you're ready to explore the location. The expedition's crew is divided into smaller boats. On your way to the shore, you notice a group of animals. They are far from the smoke, and it looks like they have themselves a mealtime. The Smoking Hills are located in the Arctic tundra, and there are rich fauna and flora nearby. Slowly, you're approaching the shore. Now you see the cliffs are made of red-striped rocks that look like they've been hand-painted by someone. 
There's another place on Earth with similar hills, and it is located in Peru, all the way to South America. The so-called Rainbow Mountain, or Seven-Colored Mountain, is a mesmerizing natural phenomenon. They are formed by the sediment of different materials. While the smoking hills are mainly red, over in Peru, these mountains have stripes of lavender, gold, red, and even turquoise. When you finally leave the boat on the foot of the smoking hills, you begin your hike up. Stepping is difficult with your special boots. The soles are made specially to support high degree temperatures, but it sure is hard to keep your balance. Before you know it, you're as close to the burning rocks as you can get. Your first impression is to get out of there as fast as possible. Conditions for human life are harsh over there. It's inhospitable and everything about the place says you shouldn't stay for long. But you are also beyond curious. You might ask yourself how these rocks keep burning for so long. The science behind it is not too complicated. The rocks you're looking at are called shales. They are a type of sedimentary rock formed by clay minerals. Your guide explains that the secret to the smoke lies on the ground. The soil is formed by sulfur and coal. When they get in contact with oxygen, they spontaneously ignite, releasing the smoke you're now seeing. The few ponds in the region have very acidic water. Scientists say that this world region is the only one to show a negative pH. It means this water is naturally corrosive, so you don't dare drink it. Make sure to bring your own water bottle when leaving the ship. You spend a few hours there, but it seems like a whole day. The suits are heavy, and breathing through a gas mask is not your idea of comfort. At the end of the day, you head back to the ship, enjoying a beautiful Arctic sunset on the way. On the morning of your third day, you're in for a nice surprise. You're not heading out again. Instead, you're going to take a trip to outer space. Metaphorically, of course. Your guide talks about the connection between the smoking hills and Mars. Looking for life on Mars has been a journey all on its own, but recently, scientists discovered the exciting presence of Jerosite on the smoking hills. And guess what? Jerosite is an abundant mineral on Mars. Experts think that this may indicate that Mars did have running water at some point in the past, since Jerosite needs groundwater to form. This huge discovery may take science many steps closer to a breakthrough. Has life really existed on other planets in the solar system? Mars has been on the map for scientific research for being the most likely planet to have developed life. The atmospheric temperature now is unbearable for above-ground life, but it was similar to Earth's at some point. The most important proof needed is to find the evidence of running water. Right now, as we speak, the Curiosity rover is out there looking for any piece of information that can hint at the existence of life on Mars, past or present. Just out of curiosity. Curiosity, the rover I mean, has been exploring the surface of Mars for over 3,566 days so far. If you do the math, it makes for 9 years and 279 days. And in case you're wondering, why are we so eager to find life on other planets? According to NASA, the research for life on other planets can help us explain a lot about our own history. Where we came from, and maybe even where we're headed. And who could have guessed that scientists could begin to find answers for that in the Arctic tundra? That's exciting, right? Now, it's day four aboard the ship, and the expedition is coming to an end. Time to head back to mainland Canada. You just visited one of the world's most inhospitable places with a lot of impressions. Now it's time to tell us what you thought about the journey and what you learned along the way. Write it all down in the comments below. How many people do we need to create a new civilization? And not on Earth but on Mars and in limited conditions. And if we create this colony and send them off, what problems will they face? How can they survive that far away from home without any support? A recent scientific study sheds light on these questions, so let's take a look at it. All right, so you wanna colonize Mars, right? Well, it's not an easy task. 
Mars is the fourth most distant planet from the Sun and the seventh largest in the solar system. This lonely red guy is very similar to our Earth. Moreover, before it became a boundless desert, it could well have even looked like Earth now. Millions of years ago, there was water, oceans, plants, and who knows, maybe even life. It would be nice to put all these cool things back there. No wonder we've been talking about colonization of this planet for a very long time. Now, SpaceX claims that their proposed interplanetary spacecraft could deliver 100 people to Mars. The owner of the company, billionaire Elon Musk, talked about creating a fleet that could provide a constant flow of resources to Mars. But how realistic are all these fantasies? Actually, not very much. Before sending people to Mars, we need to solve a number of issues. For example, the incredible radiation exposure, toxic soil, low gravity, low temperatures, and all sorts of other nasty things. And this is just the beginning. It will take at least a couple of decades to create a vehicle that can actually successfully land on Mars and return back. But let's do a thought experiment and imagine that we finally decided to colonize Mars. How will things turn out? Recently, scientists published a new study on this topic. This study is called Minimum Number of Settlers for Survival on Another Planet. The author is Jean-Marc Salotti, professor at the National Polytechnic Institute of Bordeaux in France. His article was published in the Scientific Reports Journal. As you might have guessed, the study was trying to find out how we could colonize another planet. How many resources do we need? How should this colony live? What kind of work should they do? And how long will it take? And, of course, exactly how many people do we need for all of this? Let's try to answer that. Now, imagine that we've moved into a wonderful future. Well, not really. A terrible future, actually. In his study, Salotti suggested that life on Earth was threatened by some catastrophic event. So the only way for humanity to survive is to go to Mars or some other planet. In this imaginary scenario, unfortunately, the supply delivery from Earth was interrupted, or even gone. Now, the colony has to support itself somehow. Well, here's where we already stumble upon a bunch of problems. For example, we're not sure how well the people in the colony will work together. Will they communicate with each other like normal human beings? Will they share their time and resources as they should? Humans are constantly ruining things for other humans. I can even bet that it was their fault we had to flee to Mars. But even if we forget about that, how about organizational issues? What equipment do we have? What will we use to extract resources? What skills would we need? You know what? Who cares? In our case, these things don't matter. All that we know is that the colony doesn't have a lot of initial resources and equipment, and the human factor is absolutely unpredictable. So the chances of survival are pretty low, but we need to survive somehow. In this case, Salotti describes two things that will have a huge impact on our survival. These things are essentially variables in a mathematical equation. The first one is the availability of local resources. Basically, it means water, oxygen, and all sorts of useful chemical elements. These resources should be somehow mined and easy to use. Fortunately, we're not starting from scratch. We already know a lot about Mars. What resources are there? How can they be used for life support, agriculture, and industrial production? The colony is lucky because all this has been studied at various seminars and published in reports and books over the past years. Thanks to this, we know what will be available to our colony. For example, we know that gases could be extracted from the atmosphere and minerals from the soil. On Mars, we could provide such things as iron, glass, and even organic compounds. The most important problem here is the service life of the equipment that our new Martians start with. They'll have to get as many materials as possible before the tools break. Keeping them in good condition will be almost the most important task. The second thing is the production capacity, or the speed of work. We have a specific list of things we need to do, make some tools for example, and all this must be produced in sufficient quantities before the literal deadlines. 
Salati says that the most important thing here will be the so-called sharing factor. Imagine one person trying to survive on Mars. They would have to do all the tasks on their own. They would need to find or build their own system for supplying drinking water, oxygen, and electricity generation. We've already seen how this played out in the movie The Martian. This task wasn't easy at all. There's always not enough time, and all of this is just too much for one person to handle. Unless you're Matt Damon, of course. So, surprisingly, we need a fairly large colony. This significantly distributes the burden. Each person spends less effort, gets tired less, and, as a result, the efficiency and speed of work grow. This is where the sharing factor comes into play. Now we need to calculate this number. If we want, for example, to build something, how many people do we need to do this quickly and efficiently? How can we optimize the work as much as possible? Well, it depends on the needs of these people, on available resources, random things like weather, and so on. But in general, this number can be estimated and calculated using some mathematical functions. Salati tells in more detail about these functions in his article. You can read it yourself if you're interested, but in general, he describes five areas that need to be taken into account when calculating this number. These areas are ecosystem management, energy production, industry, buildings, and the human factor. The human factor includes such things as the upbringing and education of children, sports, games, music, and so on. In the end, it all comes down to two things, how much time we have and how well the people in the colony will work with each other. So, what was the result of all these calculations? In the end, Salati found out that we would need at least 110 people to successfully survive on Mars. This is the minimal number needed to create a self-sufficient civilization. And it will be better if we don't take too many people with us. The more people we take on the spacecraft, the more difficult it will be to predict the results. After all, as we've already said, humans are always ruining things for other humans. So it's better to stick with about 110 people. Of course, this is a rough estimate and there are a bunch of different assumptions and uncertainties, but even this number is already very useful. Now the scientists know how many people is a minimum for colonization of another planet. Colonizing other planets is a very complex issue, and it will take us a very long time to resolve it. It's very unlikely that we'll fly to Mars in the near future. This task may take several decades, or even a century. Therefore, the best solution would be to try our best to save Earth until we can begin to conquer other planets. Ah, uh, what a nice cosmic family. Meet Mars. I bet you've met him before. These two little guys are Phobos and Deimos, Mars's small moons. But it seems like Mars isn't treating the little ones the right way. Phobos and Deimos are believed to be captured asteroids. However, Phobos is gradually moving closer to Mars due to gravity and it is predicted that it will eventually be destroyed by the planet's gravity within the next 35 million years. I won't be around then. So, I imagine this will result in a ring of debris around Mars, similar to Saturn's rings. However, this process is a natural phenomenon and not an act of destruction by Mars. Apparently, Phobos is getting ripped apart by the crazy gravitational forces of the red planet. But wait, there's more! Phobos has these crazy parallel grooves all over its surface. We used to think that they were from an asteroid crash, but now scientists think they're actually from Mars's intense gravity pulling the moon apart. Talk about a rough ride! Scientists have this wild idea that when a little guy like Phobos gets too close to a big guy like Mars, it starts to stretch out towards it. They call it the tidal force. Phobos is predicted to get stretched out so much that it'll actually break apart. Crazy, right? And the debris from the Moon will form a tiny ring around Mars, just like Saturn's rings. Now, some people thought that Phobos' tiger stripes were caused by tidal forces before, but that theory got shut down because the Moon is just too darn fluffy. But now, these genius researchers ran some computer simulations and found out that maybe there's a hard shell underneath all that fluff that could create grooves on the surface. But don't worry. 
at the rate Phobos is going, it's going to crash into Mars in about 40 million years. But if tidal forces are already tearing it apart, it might not even last that long. However, we'll still have the chance to learn more about Phobos. NASA just picked 10 rock star researchers from all over the U.S. to join the science working team for JAX's Martian Moons Exploration, or just MMX, mission. As NASA-supported participating scientists, they'll be helping JAXA explore the two Martian moons, Phobos and Deimos. And get this, they're even planning to land on Phobos and grab a surface sample. The mission is set to launch in 2024, and we'll get our hands on that sample in 2029. Seven of the lucky researchers will be using the MMX flight instruments to conduct their research. Phobos is a real oddball. It's only 17 miles wide and orbits Mars at a distance of 3,728 miles, to be precise. Now that's way closer than Earth's moon, which takes a whole 27 days to orbit us. But Phobos is in a death spiral toward Mars and is slowly falling towards the planet's surface at a rate of 6 feet every 100 years. But there must be a reason why Mars is acting that nastily, right? What if it's all just because of plain vengeance? Well, okay, picture this. Mars is minding its own business, being all hot and watery like a young Earth. It's got a sweet magnetic field that's protecting it from cosmic radiation and keeping its atmosphere nice and thick. Hey, life is good. But then, at least 20 asteroids, each the size of a small country, come crashing down on Mars like a giant game of cosmic whack-a-mole. One of them even leaves a crater that's almost 2,000 miles wide. Now imagine how Mars must feel with two asteroids being its moons after what other asteroids did to the red planet. All these impacts are like a massive punch to Mars's gut, and its already weak magnetic field is knocked out cold. The core gets all overheated and can't circulate properly, which means no more magnetic field to protect the planet. It's like as if you were wearing nothing at the depth of the Mariana Trench. If it were possible, you'd be defenseless and chilly. It's basically what happened to Mars. So now, poor Mars is out there in the cold, unprotected from all those nasty cosmic rays. It's like going outside without sunscreen. Not a good idea. But at least we can learn from Mars's mistakes and make sure Earth doesn't have the same fate. Maybe we should start investing in some asteroid insurance. <laughs> but trust me, the red planet isn't mean at all. It's actually pretty friendly. While Mars may seem to be pretty tough for Phobos, there's something that might be thriving with Mars's help. So get this, a team of scientists found a way to grow rice on Mars. Yep, you heard me right. They used MMS, not the outdated way to send pictures, but a special soil called Mojave Mars Simulant. It's supposed to mimic Martian soil. And here's the catch, Martian soil has these nasty percolate salts that can be toxic for plants. So the team grew three types of rice, one normal, and two gene-edited with mutations that make them better at handling stress, like drought or salinity. And guess what? The mutant strains were able to root in soil with one gram of percolate per kilometer. Take that, Martian soil! But hold up. The rice grown in the MMS didn't turn out as great as the ones grown in regular potting soil. So the team decided to mix a quarter of the potting soil with the Martian simulant, and looky there, the plants started developing better. Now these scientists aren't just thinking about feeding Martians. They also want to see if their findings can help grow crops in places on Earth with high salinity. And get this, the whole project started when two researchers met for coffee and decided to try growing plants together. Well, isn't that nice? I suspect you're about to say, hey! But if you want to grow rice on Mars, you have to ship insane amounts of water from Earth, and it's not easy to quench this plant's thirst. You're right. You need about 449 gallons of water to only grow a pound of rice. But guess what? Scientists made a groundbreaking announcement at the Lunar and Planetary Science Conference in Texas. They found a relic glacier near Mars' equator. That's right, water ice on Mars, even near the equator. This is huge news, and could mean there's even more ice just below the surface. It's not just any glacier, it's a relic glacier that's estimated to be 3.5 miles long and up to 2.5 miles wide. 
It's like the size of a small town. It's got all the features of a glacier, including crevasse fields and moraine bands. But get this, it's not actually ice. It's a salt deposit that formed on top of the glacier while preserving its shape. So, how did this salt deposit form? Well, it turns out that volcanic materials blanketing the region might have something to do with it. When these materials come into contact with water ice, sulfate salts may form and build up into a hardened, crusty layer. Over time, erosion removed the volcanic materials, exposing the sulfates and revealing the glacier's unique features. This glacier is young, likely from the Amazonian geologic period. That means that Mars has had surface ice in recent times. Who knows what other icy secrets Mars is hiding? But hold your horses, there's still more research to be done. Scientists need to figure out if there's still water ice preserved underneath the salt deposit, or if it has disappeared entirely. And if there is still water ice at shallow depths near the equator, that could have major implications for human exploration. Imagine being able to extract water from the ground at a warmer location. That would be a game changer. So let's see what else these scientists uncover about our favorite red neighbor. Maybe someday, we'll even get to visit that salt glacier statue in person. See you next time! A giant volcano has been found near Mars's equator. It was literally hiding in plain sight. It's deeply eroded but active from ancient to recent times. There might even be remnants of glacier ice near its base. That's why this discovery might indicate a promising new location to search for life, as well as a potential destination for future human and robotic exploration. The discovery of a giant volcano and a possible sheet of hidden glacier ice was announced at the 55th Lunar and Planetary Science Conference in Texas. The volcano is located in the eastern part of Mars Tharsis Volcanic Province, between Labyrinth of the Night and Valleys of Mariner. The formation was actually repeatedly spotted by spacecraft orbiting Mars, but it's so deeply eroded that it was hard to recognize it for what it really was. The structure is still awaiting its official name. At the moment, it's referred to as the Noctis Volcano. It reaches a height of 29,600 feet and spans an impressive 280 miles across. Such a giant size indicates that the volcano has been active for a very long time. In its southeastern part, there's a thin recent volcanic deposit, and beneath, glacier ice might still be present. Scientists were examining the geology of the area where they had spotted the remains of a glacier the year before when they realized they were inside a volcano. Several clues gave away the volcanic origin of the eroded structure. For example, the area of the central summit has a few elevated mesas forming an arc. It reaches the highest point and then slopes downhill from the summit. The outer slopes extend out to 140 miles in different directions. The remains of a collapsed volcanic crater that used to host a lava lake are located near the center of the structure. Lava flows and deposits made of volcanic ash cinders, pumice, and rock fragments ejected during eruptions, as well as hydrated mineral deposits, appear in several spots within the structure. In addition to the volcano, a large area of volcanic deposits within the volcano's perimeter has been found, too. It covers an area of 1,930 square miles and contains loads of low, rounded, elongated, blister-like mounds. Such terrain is believed to be a field of rootless cones, mounds produced by explosive steam venting or steam swelling. It happens when a thick cover of hot volcanic materials happens to rest on a water or ice-rich surface. The Noctis volcano seems to have a long and complicated history of modifications. They might have occurred because of the combination of fracturing and thermal and glacial erosion. Researchers believe the volcano could be a vast shield made of layers of pyroclastic materials, lava, and ice. The latter might have appeared due to snow and glaciers accumulating on the volcano's flanks through time. Eventually, fractures and faults developed in the region, probably due to the uplift of the Tharsis region on which the volcano sits. Lava started to rise through various parts of the volcano. It led to thermal erosion and the removal of huge amounts of hidden ice. Entire sections of the volcano collapsed. Glaciers continued the erosion process, 
giving the numerous canyons crisscrossing the structure their peculiar shape. If this version is correct, then possible hidden sheets of glacier ice around the volcano might be the remains of the latest glaciation that impacted the Noctis volcano. And still, a lot about the newly discovered formation remains a mystery. It's obvious that it has been active for a long time and started to grow early in Mars's history. But it's unclear when exactly. Even though it erupted even in modern times, it's unknown if it's still volcanically active. Will it erupt again when people begin to colonize the Red Planet? And finally, if it has been active for a very long time, is it possible for the combination of constant warmth and water from ice to allow the site to harbor life? <laughs>